Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, and this is Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, and it's about leadership, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. My special guest today is the president of our Honolulu Star Advertiser. He is Dennis Francis. And today we are going beyond midweek. Hey, Dennis, welcome to Beyond the Lines. Hi, Rusty. Dennis, you've been doing some incredible work throughout the years. I mean, you basically own almost all media and publishings. I mean, it's, it's amazing. But I want to first ask you if you can share a bit about your background. Sure. Um, I was uh, born in Kentucky, and I grew up in Ohio, uh, which qualifies me for most. Uh, some people will know that Kentucky is known for their college basketball. Uh, so I'm a good Kentucky Wildcat basketball fan since I was born in Kentucky. And I grew up in Ohio, so I'm an Ohio State football fan. So I, I take the best of, of both worlds there. And uh, I, I began my newspaper career in Ohio in a small town uh, uh, in the um, uh, um, southern part of Ohio. And then I uh, also uh, uh, worked in newspapers in South Carolina and Washington, D.C., Vermont, and then Honolulu for, for the last 30 some plus years. So, Dennis, what got you interested in media and publishing? That's a great question, and, and, and the honest answer is it was, it was purely by chance and a little bit by necessity. Uh, I was uh, going to a small community college um, where I was in my hometown area, and uh, I came home uh, one uh, uh, evening from uh, evening class, and my mother was sitting at the, at the table, and uh, we were kind of the lower middle class uh, economic sec uh, 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 sector, and she informed me that night that money was tight and we were running uh, tight on funds and you know I can't afford my education, pay for my education any longer, so I'm gonna have to get a job to help um, pay for the education. So I picked up my uh, local daily little newspaper and it said, career opportunity. You know, like, like the ads that used to say those kinds of things, like if you wanted to work at McDonald's or somewhere, career opportunity, learn the business from the ground up. Uh, so I, uh, I caught my attention and uh, I went and, and applied and filled out an application and, and uh, started at the very bottom. I, was, I think my title was district manager, although basically what that meant was I was supervising the newspaper carriers, the, the boys and girls at that time who rode bicycles and delivered papers door to door. Um, and, and that was really how I got started in the business. So I did that. I was doing that for about going to school at the same time for about six months or so. And realized that I, I love what I I love this job. I loved what I was doing, and uh, um, I decided I, eventually I, I dropped out of of college and decided to focus on this career opportunity. Uh, and uh, and it ended up being correct. It was my career, and that's the uh, I've never looked back, and I've been in newspaper business ever since. Wow, I love hearing that how it all started and. And Dennis, I remember the Honolulu Advertiser and the Star Bulletin, and you made the decision to merge both newspapers. Why did you decide that? Well, two, two, great, two great newspapers, well, both well over 100 years old. Uh, you know, it, was, it wasn't necessarily totally my decision, but I was clearly involved in it and, and participated in, in the execution of, of the merging of, of those two newspapers. Um, the, the, the market for a size of the community of Honolulu uh, just got to the point where it really was difficult to sustain profitably uh, two separate daily newspapers. And that was really the, uh, what really drove the, the, the merge, so to speak. Uh, it was actually a, a, a buying and a selling, but what actually ended up being is putting the two newspapers together. Well, Dennis, looking back, that was a brilliant decision, right? <laughs> well, it, it, yeah, it's been it's been it's been uh, very positive for sure. You know, it's it's allowed uh, you know one profitable 
entity to to operate in Honolulu. Um, and it's, you know, it's still COVID came along and became another issue. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it's been good for the community and I think good for employees of, uh, Oahu publications. And Dennis, you were honored by that national magazine editors and publishers magazine as being the national publisher of the year. I mean, and you're on the cover right there. And, right. and Dennis, you have been such a successful leader for so long and <sighs> I want to ask you, what are your thoughts on what are some of the things that the greatest leaders do? Well, number one, I think, and I think it's true for for certainly uh, you know, my newspaper, uh, our industry, and, and I think for almost any um, business in, 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 the, in the country is uh, surrounding yourself with good people. You know, you'll, you'll quickly realize when you're at the top. It is lonely at the top, as they as they as they say, but it, it doesn't have to be that lonely if you have good people around you. The only reason that things can get lonely is if you decide to isolate yourself and, and make all the decisions yourself, uh, because you'll end up finding out that you're probably not the, uh, as smart as you think you are. Um, you, 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 with the collaboration around your team, uh, building a good team is is, is really, I think, uh, the most critical. Um, point that a leader uh, can can contribute, but also secondly, after that, is uh, making decisions and be a decision maker. You know, you, and not sit on things forever. Not uh, as I say, uh, polish the apple too long. You know, it, it's good. It's good enough. Let's let's go. Um, so so being able to execute uh, decisions that are made, and 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 then thirdly, be successful. You know, you're, you're not a good leader if you're not successful. So that, that's, I mean, you can you know, put all the effort you want and, and all the other things uh, uh, aside. If, if you're failing, you're, you're not a good leader. I mean, that's just, that's just I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. And that's how we're all judged. No, I completely agree with you. Really good three points there. And Dennis, how would you describe your leadership style? Uh, I certainly I, I, I like to listen. I, I, I listen uh, a lot to, uh, to to the folks around me. Um, uh, I like to to uh, uh, absorb as much data as I can uh, to make uh, good decisions. And then once uh, we get to a point to to uh, execute a plan, we move. You know, I, I always like to say that that, um, and I've, folks who know me know I've I've said it many times, but I'm, I'm a, I'm a ready, uh, fire aim type person. You know, I, I, I like to, uh, I referred to polishing the apple earlier, but I, I like to get to a point where we have a reasonable plan. Uh, we've, we've asked enough questions. We got enough, uh, uh, points in, in our, in our, on our marketing plan or our, our strategic approach. And then we move, uh, that, that I'm assuming that we have enough, uh, uh, measurement points along the way, and we're paying attention to the project, whatever it may be, to make adjustments on the fly as we go. Um, I feel that gives us an advantage uh, in the market that when you're you're out, you've left the dock already. Uh, there's no going back, but you can fix it uh, uh, if you see that we're moving left of center in one way or another. But it's important to uh, to move and to and to make a decision and, and get out there. Ready, fire, aim. I love that. <laughs> now, Dennis, what are what are some of the challenges you face in your business? Uh, a, a lot, as, as you can imagine, the uh, the media business and this particularly in the newspapers, but it's just all media, really all media. Uh, and uh, we're certainly not alone in, in facing challenges. But but our, our challenge is, has always been and, and I'll, I'll share a story that when I first started in this business in 19. Uh, 77 and don't do the math on me but uh, uh, back then when you were start when you started in the newspaper business or you started any business you were you were not necessarily uh, uh, given training you were given a manual if you were a vacuum cleaner salesman or you were a, a, a car repair person you, you you received a manual and it said basically read this manual and this tells you how to do your job uh, the, the manual that I received said welcome to the exciting world of the newspaper business our number one challenge, and this is 1977, remember, uh, is 
attracting young readers to read the newspaper. Well, uh, for the last you know, four decades, you've heard the reason newspapers are, are struggling or newspapers will eventually die one day as they can't attract young readers. Well, that's been the case for a long, long, long time. Uh, back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you were able to transition folks from uh, 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 younger readers who might not particularly be into the newspaper eventually into uh, as their life's changed to, to be a newspaper reader. Uh, but now that's, that's even changed. And certainly with the digital era, uh, uh, we, we've, we try to do, do as much as we can digitally and all the, the digital platforms and we, we, we are on all of them. And we do that quite well, but it's uh, uh, the economics of, of that are quite different uh, from the newsprint side. Um, so it's, it's, it's difficult at times to figure out how we're going to pay for everything uh, because the, the revenues are uh, digitally are, are, are significantly different than they are on the print side. Wow, that's some interesting insights there, Dennis. And Dennis, you met one of my idols, Tiger Woods, <laughs> and you got to play golf with him. How was that that day? How was that experience like? That was uh, surreal at best. I mean, that, and nerve wracking. Uh, uh, it was again purely by chance. You know, uh, I, I got a, I received a call from um, uh, at that time the, the tournament was was called the Mercedes Championship. So I received a call from one of our advertisers that said a, a dealer from Georgia uh, was snowed in somewhere and couldn't make his flight. And do you want to uh, play in the tournament pro am? And I said, Well, sure, love to. I said, well, we, you know, the draw party, you don't know who you're playing with, of course, but when you get over there, they'll, they'll fill you in. Well, I find out when I get there uh, that I'm playing with Tiger Woods. And um, back then he was, you know, it was really right in his prime. And of course he was the number one player in the world. So you can imagine uh, I'm on the first tee. And, and normally when you, I've played a lot of the programs and you have your friends and family around you, you know, or maybe some strangers, maybe 50, 60 people walking around. Well, I'm standing there and there's thousands because they want to see Tiger Woods, of course. And, you know, they announced ladies and gentlemen, now in the number one tee, the number one player in the world and winner of all these tournaments. And, and they pause and they say, Tiger Woods. And then I, it just gave me you know, uh, chills to know that I'm, I'm on the same tee box with Tiger Woods, but not exactly the same tee box. He was way further back, but um, uh, he, he was a, uh, a gentleman to play with. Uh, he was uh, 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 super helpful, friendly. Uh, I, I, I couldn't have been uh, more thrilled to, to to play with him, and uh, and, and it was very nerve wracking because I'm I'm an average at best golfer, um, and most, some of the guys I play with probably wouldn't even describe it as that. But um, to to play with someone of that of that ability and worrying about I'm going to hit somebody or. Um, uh, you know, just being just totally nervous about it. It was, it was quite the experience. Wow. Well, what a, I mean, <laughs> what a story. I mean, <laughs> how lucky were you to draw him in? And Dennis, you also met President and Michelle Obama. I mean, what, I mean, that is amazing. What kind of uh, questions did they ask you? Well, I was, that was a fun experience too. I, I, um, uh, I, I wasn't even told that we were meeting the president. Uh, and I was I was part of the planning committee for for uh, APEC, and um, the uh, uh, few of the business community leaders were involved to to, to be there for an event. Uh, so I'm I'm in the the room waiting is having a basically I think we we're having a cocktail, and then you see some people scurrying around in their suits and they got the 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 the, the wires in their ears and those kind of things and I was curious. And then you 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 hear, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, and, and he walks into the and I, I was totally stunned because we were we weren't told that we were going to meet uh, the, the president, and um, so um, it was supposed to be a supposed to be a, a few seconds of meet and greet and shake a hand and then to get a photo and move on and 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 for most folks that that was what was happening. So I get up and I'm rushing up to. I shake his hand and 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 greet Michelle, and um, and then I'm ready to move. And then he asked me a question, and uh, he he knew he, he could see my profile, I guess. And he said, "Oh, you're you're the publisher for 
the newspapers. And he said, now, when I lived here, uh, there were two newspapers. And so now they have merged. And, and I said, yes, that's correct. And, and he says, well, how's it going? Uh, well, that's a broad, that's a broad question. <laughs> like, how's it going? Okay, well, and I see everyone waving at me to, you know, the, the help, the, the, the folks around him, like, move on, your, your, your turn's over. And, and so I started to, to tell him about how it's going. And, and, and then at once I, and I realized that I had to be brief. So um, he then asked me after I, after I uh, gave him the answer, he then asked me uh, what, basically what you just asked, what, what are the challenges of today's uh, in the newspaper world? So again, another broad question for not an easy answer. And, and I could see people you know, anxiously trying to get me to move on. And I, I was like, well, he's the president of the United States. <laughs> he's asking me questions. What am I supposed to do? So that was fun, though. It was a really good experience. Wow, that's amazing, Dennis. <laughs> and Dennis, you're also the owner of Midweek. I, 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 I was so honored that you guys had um, featured me on your cover and that was in 2010. Right. I had our, our team had won 17 consecutive state championships at that time. And Midweek, I absolutely love it. Why is Midweek such a popular uh, publication? Well, it's an easy answer. Uh, Midweek uh, is mailed, directly mailed to every mailbox on the island of Oahu. So roughly 280,000 uh, households are, are, are receiving it. Um, and it's, 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 it's family friendly, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a lot of, um, uh, hard hitting journalism, but it's, but it's a, it's a publication for everyone. Uh, and, uh, and it does, re, you know, it, it, it's delivered to every, uh, household on the Island. And so that, that helps make it uh, very popular. And Dennis, you have both of my books and you know that I talk so much about creating that superior culture of excellence. And that's exactly what you've done with your businesses throughout the years. Yes. What are some things that stood out to you in the books? Uh, well, I have one particular one that I, I, I uh, was one of my favorites was, and I don't know if I quote it correctly or uh, exactly or not, but, but it was basically making uh, uh, big victories and big uh, out of, of all the small victories. A lot of small su success stories will eventually turn into to big ones, and and I, I really took that to heart because I think that's exactly true, and especially true in in in, in our business today, um, because we 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 put a lot of small victories together called revenue with a lot of small much smaller advertisers than than we were perhaps doing about ten years ago, um, the days of of the Sears and and J.C. Penney and Circuit City and Toys R Us and even back in the day with Liberty House and all those the major big conglomerates are, are gone. Uh, you know, so so uh, those were the big big accounts that are now replaced by much much smaller local accounts. Um, so to have the, those uh, those types of of small victories, if you have a lot of them, they 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 turn into big success. And I and I also part of that that um, story that you described in, in your book was talking about attitude, and and uh, the attitude is incredibly important. And 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 even for you know for me, it, it still reminds me of the times that I start to to worry about too many things, and I start to get a pessimistic, negative uh, attitude. And and it's and it's and I think you made the point in your book that if you change your attitude, you can change. Uh, potentially, uh, the result, and and at least how you approach things, and uh, um, and it's true. Uh, it, it's it's easy to say, uh, hard to do, but your attitude is incredibly important, and especially as a leader, because people feed off you. Even when if you're in the elevator, even if you're just walking, uh, which 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 I do from time to time. I got to put my face in my phone and. And I'm I'm reading and texting while I'm walking down a you know a hallway, and, and somebody might walk by you, and uh, I didn't even acknowledge them because you're you're, you're so focused on, on those kinds. Of, but it's a it is an attitude, and attitude is very very important. No, I I like that you brought up little victories and and attitude because positivity is a choice, and you know, I'm trying to inspire everybody to choose better choices, and hopefully they can inspire their team members to do the same and. Dennis, you are also the owner of 
one of my favorite magazines, high luxury magazine. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it's absolutely classy. I mean, I look forward to every issue. Why is high luxury such a popular magazine? Well, first, and thank you for that. Well, first, you know, that was our, our first mag magazine that we launched. Um, and, um, and, and now it's over 15 years old. You know, we, we, we as a newspaper industry here in, town, and here in Honolulu, we decided to look for other revenue streams. And, and we began to look at some of the community-based mag, uh, magazines. Um, High Luxury was our first, and we have many, many others since then. Um, focused on uh, lots of different targets, but high luxury we targeted uh, basically main mainland uh, uh, high luxury luxury uh, type retail stores um, that you'll see mostly at Alamoana Mall or some in Waikiki and some of those places. But uh, there wasn't, you know, a lot of times when you you make decisions like this, you're basically doing it because there isn't uh, any anyone else doing it. And we thought that was an opportunity for us to, to get a, a, a potential a type of advertiser that we don't normally would, would, would get into the, into the newspaper. It's a different audience, different market, different demographic. But interestingly, you know, we, we have several advertisers that, that, that uh, came out of the lux high luxury magazine that you'll see in our newspaper, uh, Hermes and, and Harry Winston and um, uh, Rolex and some of the, and some of the others. That there's probably not a newspaper in the country our size that would get those type of ads, and we're getting them because we had the relationship with High Luxury Magazine. And Dennis, you've helped our community in so many ways throughout these years. I mean, you've donated to the Arthritis Foundation. You've also helped uh, the Ronald McDonald House, I, I know. And can you tell me about what you did to help the Ronald McDonald House? Yeah, that's an interesting story, uh, and it goes back quite a ways. Uh, when I was uh, when I first moved to Hawaii, I was the vice president of circulation for the White Newspaper Agency, and that was in the early like 1990, 1991. And uh, um, I decided to to launch a a, a program with McDonald's uh, through their drive-throughs, uh, where we would sell newspapers through their drive-throughs. And then we give part of the proceeds, a good part of the proceeds back to, to uh, the local Ronald McDonald house. Uh, that ended up being so successful. We were selling thousands and thousands of newspapers uh, a day through all the drive-throughs. Uh, you get your coffee, get your, your, your sandwich and, and, and buy a newspaper. And we promoted it as, you know, buy your newspaper there because you're helping Ronald McDonald house. And uh, we ended up uh, donating literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years. Uh, through the proceeds. Uh, what was interesting about that is that the, the program is that it, it won a national award. And then you started seeing a McDonald's all across the country, all across the mainland with the same, you could be in California, Arizona, or Ohio, or uh, Georgia. You go through a, a McDonald's drive through and the local newspaper there would have the same uh, uh, ability to, to sell their newspapers and give back to their local McDonald, Ronald McDonald house as, as we did. And so I, I, I don't even know what the, the total would be for the country, but uh, it, it went on for decades and it still is, is to this, to the day, to the, to, uh, today, but it's obviously uh, uh, a little bit different in the digital world than it was when it was all newspapers. Wow. That's majorly impactful, Dennis. And I know that you were also the chairman of our Chamber of Commerce. Uh, was that for two years, and you were honored by them? Yes, uh, uh, I was. I was a chair for uh, supposed to be one year, but our our uh, our, our CEO Sherry uh, McNamara decided that uh, uh, she that we're going to change the board, change the bylaws to make it a two year uh, uh, chairmanship. So uh, I was on board for two years, and uh, and certainly love uh, participating with local business and, and brainstorming ways to, to help them and, uh, and, and also look, work with our, uh, uh, our, our board at the, at the chamber to, to try to improve things as much as we can for the community in Hawaii. Wow, that's impressive, Dennis. And Dennis, professionally or personally, what's a big adversity you experienced that you overcame? Um, we're still still over trying to overcome it, but I think the, the quick answer to that is the COVID experience. Uh, it was for our our company. It was quite 
uh, devastating. Uh, we lost about $30 million in, in, in the first eight months of COVID with all the shutdowns and, and, and uh, um, uh, restrictions and, and those type of things. Uh, the, all those businesses that were affected by that were my advertisers. And so when when the supply chain as a fallout after all that came disrupted and folks didn't know what kind of inventory they might have, so they they couldn't advertise something that they that they might not have uh, or might not receive. Uh, so it was it was pretty impactful. Uh, you know, certainly I wasn't alone in that. Other media certainly in town had the same problem, but but all all businesses were impacted by that greatly. Uh, and still to this day, I think there's obviously still significant fallout, but uh, trying to uh, uh, offset as much as your, your, one of your, your responsibilities as a leader is to, you lose $30 million of top line revenue that, that you need to uh, adjust costs in some way uh, to uh, uh, minimize the damage to, to, that, to, your, to your bottom line and to, to how you manage your company. Uh, so we did all the things that that uh, you hate to do, with furloughs and and four day work weeks and and um, you know part of that fallout for us was when we went digital only on Saturday and eliminated the print edition on Saturday uh, because there were significant cost savings to that. But um, but that was you know the 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 damage from COVID was significant. Uh, and I say base I think we we did overcome it. Uh, mainly because we're we're still profitable uh, despite losing that kind of top line revenue, but it uh, uh, has certainly uh, made us a much different company than than uh, we were since say back in 2010 when we when we first merged. Dennis, I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up. What what's the best advice you ever received? Uh, a couple of things. And there was both uh, when I was much younger, but you know those things kind of stick with you. Uh, the first one is is and I and 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 it was funny because I approached them both differently how I handled the the advice. The first one I received was when I first made received my first promotion, and I was now from from one of the manage one of the one of the guys to the department head. So I was managing uh, the folks that that I was that were my peers, and. We'd go to lunch during the day, uh, during the week, and we'd do things over the weekends together, and those kind of things for for the month, first month or two. Uh, I received the promotion, and then one day, my uh, the the publisher of the newspaper calls me into his office, and he asks me how it's going, and I'm telling him good things, and uh, he says, "You know, I I notice I, I see you a lot, you know, with so and so and so and so and so and so, and and says, and and I said, yeah, and I said, and and. What about the weekends? Did you? I said, yeah. We, I didn't know. I was answering the question. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on the weekends together and do things. And and he he looks at me and he says, he starts nodding his head. He was and he says, uh, if you let me uh, tell you something. He says, if you ever want to lead the band, you first got to turn your back to the crowd. And he's nodding his head and looking at me. And I and I give him a blank stare and. Basically, I could tell that I wasn't getting it. <laughs> what does that mean? And so, and then he basically explained it as it's okay to to, to um, be friends and and have a good relationship with your employees, but you 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 can't be one of the one of the guys anymore. You you have to lead them. You can't um, uh, be their best friend and their best bud. So I evolved over the last you know some decades later of. You know, that not cer certainly to that extreme that we can't be friends and we can't uh, do things together and those kind of things. But I did get his point that that um, if you're going to to lead folks, you've got to separate yourself from the crowd. The the second point that I um, advice I received was a really interesting one, and it was also when I was I was fairly young. I was I think I was 23 or 24 years old, and I was in South Carolina and. Um, I was a, a middle manager at the time, uh, striving to be the department head, but uh, uh, I received my performance review. And it was a glowing review, it was fantastic. It was really good. And and my boss is telling me that the, the publisher and the general manager of the newspaper both signed off on it. 
they, they um, both had high marks, remarks on, on my performance review. And, and I could see my boss getting a little uncomfortable. And he says, but I do want to share one remark that came from our, our publisher. And, and he, he did make a note on your review about it. And I, I said, okay. And he says, um, if, if you want to be successful, you got you to gotta dress like it. And he said, so dress for success. And I mean, my immediate reaction was, uh, was defensive. I was, wow, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't shop where you shop and I can't uh, spend the kind of money on, on ties and those kind of things that, that, that they do. I mean, they make a lot more money than I do. And I, you know, I don't, don't have that ability. And he nods and he says, he goes, I understand that. He says, but you can shine your shoes, right? And I looked down at my shoes and they were scuffed. They were, they were, they were not, you know, they were not shiny by any means. And, and that, and that stuck with me and, and, and I never forgot it that, uh, uh, I, many people will comment sometimes of, you know, of what I wear or what I'm, why I, the, the shoes I have on or those kind of things. And it's, it's generally because of that comment and that goes back a long time ago about being successful and, and dressing for success. Dennis, I love those pieces of advice. And Dennis, I want to thank you for really all the publications that you've been, I mean, because all of us in Hawaii have been impacted positively by you through your publications somehow in one way or the other. And I really want to thank you for sharing your insights on the show today. And thank you for watching Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. For more information, please visit RustyKomori.com. And my books are available on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble. I hope that Dennis and I will inspire you to create your own superior culture of excellence and to find your greatness and help others find theirs. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.